Jacob Ediskog. I work at Tuba Technologies as an identity specialist. Um, work with customers trying to figure out how to solve their security issues, how to secure their APIs, how to secure their systems. And one use case that we've been coming across quite a lot lately is the one where we want to pass on access not to our app or to our machine, but to our friend or to our family member. And that's something I want to talk about today, how we can do that using the existing standards um, that we already implement. So to begin, I'd like to show you guys a small video that I saw yesterday. Someone put this on my Facebook stream, and I want one, so I'll just show you that. <laughs> Sure, it looks like a typical U-lock. Yes, you use it to lock up your bike, and yes, it's as strong as any lock on the market, but Skylock is a lot more. You know what keyless entry is, right? Like when someone unlocks their car just by walking up to it? Well, Skylock is keyless entry for your bike. It uses always-on Bluetooth LE to connect to your phone so you can lock and unlock your bike with the tap of a button. And thanks to Skylock's solar panel, its battery never runs out. Ordinarily, I wouldn't leave my bike unattended for even an hour but Skylock isn't ordinary. It has a built-in anti-theft feature. I just log Skylock into my local Wi-Fi network and it sends me an alert if anything or anyone disturbs my bike. Skylock uses its built-in accelerometer to monitor all movement when you're not around. And you can adjust the sensitivity to make sure there's an actual threat. You don't even need to tap a button to unlock Skylock. You can set it to use your proximity to unlock. Or if you don't have your phone, just enter a code using the capacitive touchpad. Let's talk safety. Skylock knows when you've been in an accident and will check to make sure you're okay. If you're not okay, it'll alert the authorities. Help is on the way. Your bike can be out getting use even when you're not riding it because Skylock makes bike sharing super easy. You can give anyone with a smartphone access to your Skylock instantly, securely. See you later, boo boo. Right, you want one. <laughs> um, the last thing that just happened there was probably the hardest thing they did. They had a sharing going on between the, the guy and his girlfriend. And something was shared, and what was that? How did that happen? And this lock is not just a lock, it probably has tons of APIs. And you probably already figured out how many or how to build those or what you need to do this lock on your own. But what I want to focus on on this talk, if I can get this back on, is the use case that we just saw. So we had some user, we had some app, and we had an API. And the API was probably something in the lock and something on the back end. Um, and the user authorizes its app to access the API. But this use case is now what we're zooming in on. So I'm introducing two characters. We have Adam and we have Bianca. And Adam has an app that accesses an API. Adam wants to share access so that Bianca's app can access this API. And sharing is delegating. We're delegating access to someone else. That's what we're doing, right? Isn't that what Travis just said OAuth was for? OAuth is delegation, that big sign. Sort of. OAuth is something around delegation. So we have these three actors. We've got a few more, but in the simple case. We want to let this app access this dude's account on that API. That's what OAuth is. So OAuth solves this by using access tokens. Travis showed you all the flow, so I'm, I'm trying not to go into it too deeply. But the OAuth server, once you showed who you were, once the resource owner has presented themselves, sends you a token to the app. And then 
the app stores this token, and when it feels it's ready to call the API, it passes the token in the authorization header to the API. The API then either validates it on its own, if it's a JWT, because it's signed, so we can have a key to do that, or, uh, or certificate, I mean, and or it contacts the OAuth server and then gets a response and says, yes, that's a good token, and then sends the data back. That's OAuth. So OAuth is really user to app delegation. We delegate our access to an app and says this, or and the app can be a phone app, or it can be a website, or it can be whatever, but it's a program that we're trying to dele delegate access to, or a client in OAuth lingo. So this new scene uh, makes it a bit different then. We're trying to do something above that. So we want Adam that has an account probably over there at the API to let Bianca access that API. So Bianca is the one who needs the token, not Adam. So Adam can't delegate this to his app. Adam <coughs> needs to now figure out a way to, to delegate this to Bianca. And as far as I've seen it, when we've run into this a couple of times, uh, or lots of times now, is that there are two ways to do this. <coughs> I'm going to tell you both. So either you let Bianca uh, have access set up in an access table of some sort, a big database close to the API, where you set up rules around who can access what, and there you figure out a way to say, well, you know, if, if Adam is uh, saying that Bianca can access, give her access, and then whenever you need to do something, you figure it out through that table. Or you let Bianca get an access token that has a different resource owner than her own. So you get her, give her a token that belongs to someone else, actually. How do we do that? We could start with the access tables. Um, if the flow is that we need to contact this API that has an access table tied to it, we, we start always by contacting the OWASP server and saying, I need access on someone's behalf. The OWASP server then responds by challenging you. You saw this in the previous talk, but repeating is learning. Um, you enter your credentials, and the OWASP server accepts this, um, and the access token is issued. This access token is a green access token because it belongs to the green character that I made up, that is Bianca. So it's her access token. She uses that to send a request to the API. But she also needs to send additional information somehow. She needs to tell the API, I'm right now not trying to actually do something on my own stuff. I'm trying to do something on someone else's stuff. Maybe she does that in the... In the post body or whatever she's doing right now, or maybe there's a URI that tells, you know, which resource are you working on, and you treat the users as resources. You know, there's a bunch of ways of doing this if you want to distinguish between users in the API. But um, it, really, it really tangles your API with your identity management. What happens is that the API needs to then talk to the database and verify that the access is real. And it needs to know, you know, when do I need to do this? At what particular times in my uh, execution chain do I need to validate this access? Um, and then it responds with Adam's data back to the app. And this is probably the, the, the architecturally simplest way of doing it and implementally hardest way of doing it. Uh, because the API is typically not one API. Um, we're all building microservices now. How many here are building microservices? Yeah, there are some, some hands up. So you guys should come to the, the Platform Summit in November. And you who don't build microservices need to come and tell us why you don't build that. And we can have a debate, perhaps. Uh, the monolith versus the microservice. Um, so in the microservices, that, that means that we have all of these very small APIs. All of them needs to implement these access rules and co contact the database somehow or whatever type of service you have that responds with this, this access allowed data. And the tricky part is that the point of microservices is that 
you have one microservices that does each thing. So they have different resources, they have different protocols on communicating with them, perhaps they may not be alike. So if you're going to figure out what data is, is someone trying to access now, and you have to have your ID, your user tangled into that data, you're going to have to program a lot. All of these services need to figure that out, and that may be different in different cases. So you're leaving a lot up to your developers. Um, so as you can hear, it's not my preferred choice of design. It's pretty easy to implement from an admin or from an architectural perspective. Set, set it up. When, when you delegate access, just add a new row. Boom, you're good to go. But every API needs to know much about this delegation. Every API needs to resolve these access rights. And with microservices, this becomes super heavy. So what's the alternative then? <clears throat> we think that we could use something called delegated tokens. And we've used it a bunch of times. And there's a, there's a number of ways of doing this. Uh, Travis already touched this, but OpenID Connect is a companion protocol of OAuth. And we're going to use that to solve this. So before Travis's talk today, how many of you heard about OpenID Connect? Yeah, about half. That's good. So you can't run OpenID Connect without OAuth. It's built on top of that. And like Travis said, it adds the identity layer on top of OAuth. So OpenID Connect really does this. It changes our OAuth server to an OpenID Connect enabled server. Um, and that's pretty much what we need to know. But now it knows not only what access did we give, but it also knows who did what. It's a, it, it gives the identity layer, uh, it adds the identity layer into the, the OAuth server. So one thing that is really, really interesting about OAuth uh, and OpenID Connect is something called user info. And user info is an endpoint that is the simplest form of an identity endpoint that you could ever imagine. It looks like this. It is something, something, slash user info. And you call it using a get. And you pass in your OAuth token, like you would call any API using OAuth in the authorization header, bearer, space, OAuth token. That's it. When that's done, the user info endpoint responds with a JSON document that looks something like this, if you follow the standard, which you should, of course. Uh, it contains the subject, like who is the authenticated user for this OAuth token? The name, what, where, if you're going to read it for me, what would it sound like? Given name, family name, preferred username, email, picture, phone, you know, all of these basic things, shoe size, that we want to know about the user uh, are part of the user info endpoint. And all we need to do is take the access token and throw it on the user info endpoint, and we get this response back. So it super, it's super simple to get this identity layer on. There are, of course, some layers more. We need to add some extra scopes and stuff. But you can ask me afterwards, and I'll tell you. The interesting part about this is that we can take this response, and we can add anything we want in it as long as we don't override what's already there. We can't change the meaning of stuff. So we can add our own namespaces in this response. And like Travis was touching, we can add access tokens in this response. So if we say, well, we create now the new namespace called example delegations, and under there you will list your delegations, all the ones you now have access to based on your access token. Adam, for instance, he gave you access. The access token is this, it expires in five minutes, and it has the scopes, stuff, and other stuff. This is something that was discussed uh, quite a lot early on, and one of the editors of the OpenID Connect spec, Nat Sakamura, he was advocating also to, to use the user info endpoint for um, reissuance of tokens, or uh, downgrading of tokens, or creating multiple tokens. And that's what we're trying to do here. So what happened was that we got an access token for Adam now by calling the user info endpoint. But this token should contain some things for it to be really meaningful. Um, Travis told you that we have reference tokens and we have value tokens, by value, by reference. 
either it's an opaque string that you can't make any sense out of, which means it's a reference to something. Typically a database in the authorization server that says it was this user at that time, it's valid for this long, scopes, yada yada, and we add stuff in there and it makes sense for that token. If it's a jot, it, set, it says it right there in the, in the jot itself. Uh, so it should say, who was the one who authenticated? Subject. Yeah, it was Bianca, of course, uh, in the delegated case. But who is the resource owner? Let's add that in there now. Well, it's Adam who's the resource owner. So we split those two. We say they're different. In the case where it's Bianca who's the resource owner, you want to access your own stuff, the regular OAuth case. Well, those two things should say the same thing. So this flow then looks like this. The app wants to request access. The user is challenged with a password. Bianca is challenged. She enters her own password and her own username. And she gets an access token, her own access token, to access her own stuff on this server. She calls the user info endpoint with that access token. And the OpenID Connect enabled OAuth server now can take this access token and uh, respond with access token number two. And this is what came from that uh, JSON document I just showed you. So now we have two access tokens, and we can use that to call the OpenID Connect enabled, or the, the API, sorry. And the API will now say, well, an access token, great and respond with Adam's data, because it was Adam's access token that we sent in. So in the microservices case, I mean, this is exactly the same case as the regular case. We send in an access token to a microservice. All it needs to do is terminate that token. And if we want to use someone else's token, we'll send in that access token to the API, and all it needs to do is use that token. There's no difference. If we want to put a a gateway in between that does this for us, like Travis was saying, that you put a translator, external to internal tokens, etc., deep stuff. Well, it's fine. I mean, it works the same. There's no difference at all on how to act on a token, if it's a delegated access or if it's a regular access. So all the microservices need to do is, or any service for that matter, is validate the token and act on the user in the token. So we remove identity from the equation. We don't say put you know, a resource, as a user as a resource in there or something like that. Nope, don't. Just accept tokens and then whatever you do on the resource, the lock or the bike or something, act on what was in the token. So this sounds like the normal access case for OAuth. I mean, if we just send in the token, and you act on it, that's what you're supposed to do, right? Yeah, I mean, that is the case. So we don't have to modify our backends um, in order to support this. So the delegated tokens, they give us quite a lot because they're way easier to implement on the API side. And if we start building tons of APIs and we, um, we want to do this afterwards, that's gonna be tricky otherwise. So using the delegated tokens makes this easy. APIs work the same way for regular access and for delegated access, very importantly. I guess the drawback is that the app then must maintain multiple tokens. And if you're going wild here and, and delegating you know, tons, sure, that, that could be something to manage. Um, but we haven't seen that as a big problem yet, at least. So we have two alternatives. We have access table lookups or access lookups through some sort of service that responds to this, building the identity into the API, and we have the delegated token access where we remove the identity from the API entirely and throw it into the OpenID Connect server and to the OWASP server. So, to conclude, OWASP is user-to-app delegation. It's not user-to-user -user delegation. But if we add on OpenID Connect and we use its user info endpoint and we add our, our parts into that, which we can according to the spec, we can add user to user delegation and be completely standards wise in the API and how it terminates tokens. So that was that. Any questions? <laughs>